the younger people that he teaches real estate too is benefiting from the capital that he's raising from these retirees. And so everybody's benefiting from each other. You know what I mean? So we call it the circle of wealth. And I was like intrigued by that. It blew my mind. I'm like, well, damn, like, you know, I mean? I, that's my first time hearing something like that. I need to do something like that, especially in the black community. I don't, I don't know anybody doing that. So I was like, I need to duplicate that, honestly. And, you know, that's what I set out to do, you know, so that's. Two, three. Welcome to House Rich, the real estate show. We talk to average people that do above average things in real estate. Today's guest is Rod Stanback, the CEO and founder of Flip Funding. So uh, we're going to talk about hard money lending. It's um, it's a space that I'm mildly familiar with, but I, I saw a post, uh, I think it's one day, where he talked made the comparison about comparing folks' credit card APRs to hard money lending, because I think a lot of times hard money lending may get a bad rap because the interest rate is a little bit harder, but most folks have no issue with, um, you know, having a 24% APR on their liability. Why don't you use hard money lending to to buy an asset that's going to earn you more than the interest would, would cost you in the first place? So I'm uh, really, really interested in this conversation. Like you probably heard, of, there are different folks that have talked about hard money lending that have used to scale their portfolio, but I never had somebody that actually does the funding. So I'm um, ready to jump into it. Could you introduce, just introduce yourself to the, uh, the good folks and thanks for joining me? Yes, sir. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate you sharing your platform with me. So as you said, you know, my name is Rod Stanback, founder and CEO of Flip Funding. Um, I've been hard money lender for the past eight years, uh, pretty much. I started um, in 2013. I formed a company. I really didn't get started till 2014. Um, but I've been uh, actively lending ever since then. I found, you know, hard money as a real estate investor. So First and foremost, I'm a real estate investor. You know, that's my first love, but yeah. hard money lending took priority. So that's why, you know, this is what I do on a day-to-day basis um, from here on out. Okay, dope. And could you just, what, what is hard money lending? Just just for folks that yeah. don't, don't know. So hard money is essentially an alternative to traditional uh, financing. Traditional financing is something that you would obtain from a bank or a residential mortgage uh, professional. You know, whereas though they focus on investor, I'm sorry, they focus on owner-occupied properties, whereas though hard money, we're exclusively business purpose, commercial use only. So if it's not for an investment, I'm not the guy to contact, gotcha. you know, but yeah. And so you touched on a little bit, but what, what kind of folks are typically drawn to hard money lending as far as like your, your clientele? So um, real estate investors. So real estate investors that are seeking to leverage financing they may not want to use all their capital if they have enough capital to, to purchase a property on their own, or they may just want to utilize leverage and purchase, purchase multiple properties with the capital that they have. Okay. And so how, how does, like, how does somebody actually qualify for a deal? Like, let's say um, I want to buy an investment property. Um, like, like what, what, what's like step one? I don't know. I've reached out to you, but how do you, how do you evaluate me? How do you evaluate the, the opportunity for the, for the company? So, it's a little, it's a little different. Um, it's not, it's, not, it's actually not different, but it is different than um, traditional lending. Whereas though, for you guys, the pre-approval was more or less based on the individual. Whereas though, our pre-approval was more or less based on the actual property. You know, so I always highly recommend anyone before they try to place an offer or anything. And this is the same for the residential world. You know, you always want to have that pre-approval first because it gives you, not only you, but your agent confidence that, and your ability to actually execute and purchase that property. If not, they're not really going to take you serious. Uh-huh. But on a, on a hard money side, it's crucial because it allows you to run your numbers. You know, as a real estate investor, you got to run your numbers. You got to do your due diligence. So if you're not getting that pre-approval and, you know, before you even make the offer, run the numbers, talk to your lender. You know, if it's not me, whoever it is, talk to your lender, let them run the numbers, get you a term sheet. That way you can crunch your numbers accurately. And you won't worry about, working backwards, you know, getting under contract, then trying to find financing, then trying to run your numbers. Like that's, that's not the proper way to do it. You want to get pre-approved, uh, run, run the numbers, you know, get that term sheet, crunch your numbers, and then make the offer if, if all possible, you know, and this market is a bit tough because, you know, it's highly competitive yeah. and pl- properties are flying off the shelves, but that's the ideal process. So when, when you say crunch your numbers, like what type of numbers should I be, be looking at when you say crunch your numbers? So, of course, you want to look at the numbers in the deal. You know, you obviously have to consider your purchase price, your rehab costs, and the after repair value. The main thing is to make sure that you're obviously going to make a, 
a profit because if not, you're wasting not only our time but your time. You know, um, more your time is value, and you're losing you lose your money, your time, and your confidence if you fail. So you know you want to run those numbers obviously based on the deal. But you also have to consider your closing costs and your holding costs that are associated with the transaction as well. Those are two fees that you know people tend to forget about, especially newer investors. And if you you know you miss that, then you could potentially risk your profit. Okay, so so let, I guess let's let's walk through a scenario. So let's say um, I don't even know this is a viable scenario, but let's say I find a um, a home a little little beat up, uh, and I, I can purchase the the home in the lot for a hundred thousand dollars. Maybe the after repair value is is I don't know. Let's say two two fifty. Um, what do I do? I I would get a loan from you for like I don't know for like for like one fifty. Then I'd use that for um for like repairs in the home, and I get like maybe a year term or like how how what's like a typical typical deal you kind of work with? All right, so um I know all right. So you said the lot is hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah, let's say uh, you can use whatever numbers you want to make it make it make the scenario look good. I just threw some stuff out there. All right, so I just let's just uh, let's stick with your numbers. We know that the fifty thousand construction is not realistic, but okay. let's just say it is. You know, all let's right. say for hundred thousand for the lot or the property and fifty thousand for construction. ARV is um, two fifty, right? So it's a, a potential one hundred k equity on there, not including fees and stuff associated with the loan. Um, if we were to get new construction, we fund up to 90%, you know, of purchase and 100% of the construction costs. So we would give you 90,000 90, towards the acquisition for the lot or the property that you're going to tear down. And then we would give you 100% of the cost for the construction. But that cost, that 50K goes into reserves and it's released in draws. So you as an investor, you have to initiate the first phase of that construction process. So uh, if it's a, say if it's an existing building that may consist of the demo and the cleanup, you know, and then um, maybe starting the foundation, you may start that part. Um, now it's, it's 50 K. So I would highly suggest that you do at least 10 K worth of work before you suggest that. I mean, before you request that draw, because each draw, there's a fee associated with that. And that fee doesn't go to the actual lender that goes to the third party inspection company that we hire to go out there and verify that the work was actually completed, that you said you completed before we reimburse you for those funds. Okay. So once that's done, the inspector goes out there, they say, okay, you know, Dave did complete the tear down, start the foundation. He's ready for this next phase. Whatever you spent, we'll reimburse you for that. And then you continue the next phase until, you know, and that process continues until the project is completed. So it's not like you have to use the entire 50, but you might have to put down 10 grand you know, okay. skinning the game for that re for that construction. Oh, okay, that that, that make, makes sense. And as far as like the the after repair value, who's determining that? You got like an appraiser. Oh, okay, there's an appraiser goes up. Yeah, yep. So we use the third. We you know appraisers are a big pain in the ass right now, Dave. Um, mm. You know, you know that everyone knows that. So one way we try to avoid that hassle is to work with like local independent appraisers that we have rapport with, or the actual borrower has rapport with. Because we know that if there's an existing relationship, they'll be more likely to prioritize our business. Uh, we know direct going directly to the appraiser will be much cheaper than going through a, an appraisal management company, you know, and we get direct communication with them. So the, the experience will be much better. We'll get it back faster and it'll be cheaper. So, yeah, so we get them to do, if it's a fix and flip or a new construction project, we get them to do an appraisal for both the as-is value and after repair value. If it's a rehab or construction, we really only concerned with the after repair value because we know work is going to be done, but we want to see the as is value to make sure that you are purchasing something at a discount or, you know, at a fair market value at least. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, okay. And so the, the appraisers, you said you, you work with appraisers you're familiar with, are you talking about the, the company or do you actually like go out, do you actually say, hey, you know an appraiser named Chris, Chris go out there and evaluate the property? Is that the case or is it? Yeah, it can be. So, I mean, okay. it can be an appraiser that we've worked with from a particular company that we have a relationship with. But you can actually pick the appraiser to look at the property? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. okay, a little, little different than residential. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. And that's a little different than hard money, too. Not everybody offers that, but that's like a value add that, you know, we offer. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. And sorry, I, I, I kind of jumped, like, to the middle of the interview. Uh, can you go, go through your, your background a little bit? I know you said you got into hard money through investing can you kind of talk about your background and kind of what led you to this position in the in the first place 
absolutely. So um, I'm, I'm from North Philadelphia, Rich Island Projects and everything. So I had like a rough upbringing, but I did, you know, make it to college. I made it, made it to college um, for two years. And I got kicked out. Uh, right. And I got kicked out, you know, of course, that's never ideal, but I think it was a blessing in disguise because I wouldn't be here doing this interview right now, you know, if I would have, you know, went went that other path that I thought was, you know, the path for me. But I got kicked out and um, came home and dabbled into some illegal things and stuff, you know, honestly. But outside of that, you know, I went to work at Applebee's, you know, for like two, I had to do something, you know, so I went to work at Applebee's for like three years, you know, time fly. I didn't even realize, I looked up one day, I'm like, man, I've been here three years. Uh-huh. This is not what I have projected for my life. You know, yeah. I got to figure something out. And then this was around, I got kicked out into 03. Now, if you're familiar with the market back, you know, like 04 to 06, it was hot. Like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So well, I kept well, hearing. And lending, yeah. Yeah. So I, I kept hearing about real estate, real estate. I've always heard that was the path to wealth. You know, that's if you want to invest, invest in real estate. But I knew people that own real estate, but I didn't know people that was actively doing it as a full-time like business or anything like that. So um, it just was on my radar, but I didn't have the money to get involved. Um, so I said, I wanted to get aligned somewhere. So I, what I did was I went to school for at a community college for carpentry. I went and got my carpentry certificate. And then, you know, um, I found out about an opportunity at Home Depot where you can become a subcontractor doing doors and windows. So that, that piqued my interest. I wanted to do that but I didn't really necessarily have that much experience. So um, I took the entire summer and I shadowed this guy, learned how to learn how to do it. I didn't get paid a dime. You know, I learned how to do it. By the end of it, you know, I was good at it. I got, I secured my uh, contract with Home Depot. So I was doing doors, mainly doors, you know, um, making decent money, believe it or not too. Mm-hmm. But I still wanted to get involved with flipping houses and stuff. Mm-hmm. So um, my brother, he had a best friend that was, uh, he was a real contractor. Like they were taking, they were doing jobs for an investor in New York. So in Philly, you get a lot of investors from New York. They come and invest in Philly because their dollar was stretched much further, you know? So um, this guy was taking warehouses in the Temple University area and we were transforming them into a uh, student housing. <clears throat> and so I got in on that team, started doing that work, you know, and two things I learned from that experience. Um, one was that I was on the wrong end of the deal, you know, because <laughs> that guy was making the big money and we was busting our behinds, you know, out there in 110 degree weather, weather sweating. Like we had 100 <laughs> sheet rock, we had to unload and everything, but it was a great experience for me. And that experience prepared me for real estate investing because I, you know, I, I wasn't intimidated by, you know, houses that were falling down or anything like that. I knew exactly what to do. So, you know, I was prepared. So lo and behold, 2008 came around and the market tanked. You know, I didn't really know what was going on. Yeah. You know, the, the market tanked. So people knew that I was I was putting it out there prior to that. But they knew I wanted to buy some properties, you know. So somebody was like, I listen, I know a guy that has two properties for ten thousand dollars, you know. So uh-huh. and no lie, you know. So I, I said, look, I didn't ask any questions. I said, introduce me to the guy. You know, I met him. He gave me the deed. I gave him the money. I was in the game, you know, so I thought. You said this, this 2008 or? Yeah, 2008. Okay, so so it, was the market going down at this time or did, were you aware of where the market was going? At? No, I wasn't aware of the market okay. at all. Like okay. I wasn't aware of the market cycles, good, bad market yeah. or nothing, you know, but um, yeah, but it was a bad market. Again, I didn't know what was going on. Yeah. Um, and this really didn't have anything to do with that because, and I'll get to that. So. I got these two properties. I'm in the game, Dave. You know what I mean? So um, I went to work on one of them. It took me about a year, but I rehabbed. And again, not understanding the market, I didn't know that properties weren't selling or anything like that, or they shouldn't sell. I listed it. It was under contract in two weeks. You know, it was under con- in, the middle of, in the middle of a down market. So they asked me for the HUD, you know, but I'm like, the hell is a HUD? I don't know what that is, you know? So they asked me how I acquired the property. <laughs> I told them. They immediately referred me to a lawyer. So oh, okay. I told this lawyer, <laughs> I told this lawyer how I bought the property. And he was like, you know, he let me know that it was a scam, you know. So he asked me to tell him the story. I told him the story, you know, explained, you know, the guy, this and that. Coincidentally, he happened to know the guy, you know. So he was doing pro bono, 
pro bono work for in family court and he was representing this guy's family. Mm -hmm. So he told me this guy was like a con artist, this and that, and asked me if I wanted to proceed like legal, you know, um, action. But I'm like, no, because he's a con artist. I know I'm not going to get anything. I'm just going to mm -hmm. waste my money. So what I had to do was do a quiet title process. And what a quiet title process is, for those that don't know, you have to try to find the rightful owner of the property. And if after three attempts, um, well, what's it, so the guy, he was doing his research, this property, this one particular property, well, both of them, they were sitting vacant for a while. Mm -hmm. And he knew that, you know, if it was sitting vacant, more likely nobody's coming for him. But he mm -hmm. ran the search, pro property search, and he see that the, the owner was deceased. So he, he knew it was high probability that nobody would come for the property. So that's what happened. So we did the quiet title process. With the quiet title process, you have to do three um, you have to get a hire a private investigator. You have to put an ad in the paper for three, uh, three listings in the paper for three weeks in a row. You have to do three certified mailings to, if not the person, their heirs or some family member okay. to see if they want the property. Luckily on the first one, nobody responded. So I won the property and, you know, that was a learning lesson. Um, the second one, I had to do the same process, but this one, the, the owner was deceased, but the heirs were alive. So okay. they have... These both were in Philly, but the two sisters moved to Oakland. Last time they saw the property, it was in shambles, you know, and the value wasn't. So they said, give me three grand, you can have it. So I hurry up, wrote them a check, and right. I got it, you know. And then after that, I just had to learn everything I could about the about the industry. Okay. So is, just carry when you put the thing in, you just put it, where in the in the classified? Where do you put the article in the in the paper? Yeah, you put it in the um the whatever paper for the city. So this was Philadelphia, so we had to put it in like the Philadelphia Enquirer, like the largest paper. Yep, you got to put it a classified, I mean, ad in there, right. three weeks in a row. Yeah, okay. seeing if anybody will find it. Okay, okay, cool. I guess yeah, good. No, reads the paper. I think uh, nowadays, yeah. you know, so I don't know what it was back in uh in two thousand eight. Okay, cool. So that's where we kind of got the the real estate bug, and then kind of what what was the journey from from there after you kind of had those two? Oh, what did you end up selling those properties for? Just curious. So I didn't, I never sold it. After that experience, you know, I just like, kept it and I still own them to this day, both of them. So one oh, okay. is, a, yeah, the first one was a single family property. Yep. And um, the other one is a duplex. I still own both of them in West Philadelphia yep, to okay. this day. Okay, Kerry, what, what, what are they worth about right now? Curious. Uh, it's funny because I just refired both of them uh, earlier last year. So um, the one, the single family is at 250 and the other fa uh, property, the duplex is at 300. Why? So, so you you put five. So basically, you purchased them both for what for ten plus three thousand. Think yep, ten plus three thousand, so thirteen grand. Yep. Okay, that's pretty pretty good ROI. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And so we we did the, we did the rehab. But that was that just you, or did you have like a company out there who was who was I had, I, had a, I had a crew. I mean, but so I pay I overpaid for that because again, it was my first project and. I can I couldn't afford to pay you know like a lump sum, so I was like paying them about a week, you know, um, and they like milk me, you know. And like I said, I told you it took a whole year. So yeah. honestly, I don't even know what I put into it, but I I can um I can I'm sure I put in like at least a hundred thousand. It should have yeah. probably only been sixty, you know. So yeah, yeah, expensive expensive lesson, but yeah, I guess yeah, I guess I guess I guess it's kind of kind of ended well. We're still 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 going well since you own the the properties there, and then so um. After you kind of learned a little bit more of the church of trait, kind of what, what was your experience after that with uh, on purchasing properties? Cause you, you own so, about 15 property or you purchased about 15 properties? No, I still own about 15. I mean, okay. I've had about, yeah, I've did uh, like 52 flips all together, you know? Okay. So, but, um, so after that experience, you know, I, did, I was either, it was two things. I had to either do educate myself or I need to get out the game. You yeah, know yeah, I mean? yeah. So I chose to educate myself and, you know, I was, this was the time, I mean, webinars and stuff are still popular, but, uh, I was on YouTube, the devouring videos, watching everything I could, you know. But I ran across this guy, um, and he's actually still in the in the business. He's a hard money lender, and he teaches like real estate education. I just stumbled across him and um, tuned in, and um, he was he was I, I liked the guy, you know. He was giving good content. He didn't come across like a greedy salesman or stuff, a greasy yeah. salesman like most yeah. of these people do. Um, <laughs> so and I gravitated towards him. And I became my mentor. And so I was intrigued by his model because, again, like he was a, he started as a real estate investor, it's real estate developer. And then he started educating people on how to become real estate investors and stuff. But he had this method with his model called the circle of wealth. 
So again, he was a real estate investor and he shared his knowledge trying to, you know, educate other people to get in the game and become successful. But then he was a lender too. So he right. raised capital from retirees. And you know, retirees these days, they don't want to necessarily sit on their so they'll sit on their hands. You know, they they're used to like being active. They still yeah. want to feel, you know, useful. So he, um, he would raise money from them because they all have a nest egg, but a lot of them don't know what to do with it outside of having it in the bank. So he taught them about private lending. You know, you know so they'll, he'll raise money from these retirees so they can make some money off of their capital that they have. But at the same time, he's teaching them how to invest in real estate. So it's the circle of wealth because the younger people that he teaches in real estate too is benefiting from the capital that he's raising from these retirees. And so everybody's benefiting from each other. You know what I mean? So we call it the circle of wealth. And I was like intrigued by that. It blew my mind. I'm like, well, damn, like, you know, I mean? I, that's my first time hearing something like that. I need to do something like that, especially in the black community. I don't, I don't know anybody doing that. So I was like, I need to duplicate that, honestly. And, you know, that's what I set out to do, you know. So that's how I really found the hard money industry. But the thing, that thing, the thing is, he had like a training. He loves like $2,500. You go out Vegas for two days, this and that. But that was basically an introduction to hard money. I wasn't prepared for the industry at all, you know. So I had a long, rough journey for, as a lender. Okay. Okay, cool. So what, what, like, what are some of the, the struggles you, you kind of kind of had? Um, the struggle is network. So when I first I, I went this course, I finished this course, I got my certificate and whatever. I was gung-ho. I was ready to go, Dave. I was, you know, at the time, I was brokering at the time, you know, so because this guy, I learned the game from him, you know, I got introduced to it from him. Naturally, I submitted all the deals to this guy. So no lie, no exaggeration. I started generating deals and not the first year. It took me a while, you know, honestly, because again, I didn't have direction, but the second year, I, I did one deal the first year, you know, it took me till December. I started in December. I mean, January of 2014, really. And I didn't close the deal till December of 2014. Mm -hmm. But 2015, I started to get traction. I tapped into, are you, are you familiar? You remember with uh, Armando Montalago? No, 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 I'm not, no. Uh, he was down in, in Texas. He was like a, a like a real estate investing guru or whatever, but he did some scams and he's out of the game now. Gotcha, gotcha. Got but he had a training program and I tapped into someone that was in that group and they were like an affiliate partner for me. So everyone that was graduating from this course, they were ready to invest. And he was just referring them all to me. So we got traction. Uh -huh. And I submitted about 50 deals to this guy and not one of them closed. You know, it was either because his terms were horrible or one thing or another. But I had to, look, I had to you know, sit back and analyze the situation. I'm like, if this is what I want to do, I got to figure something out because yeah. I'm going to be out of business soon if I'm depending on this guy. So I had to, you know, obviously he didn't give up any resources and stuff like that. So I had to dig deep and find resources. I didn't know anybody with money at the time. I didn't have money to lend, but, you know, it took me a while and I had to find like capital sources, you know, build relationships on my own and just really figure out how to navigate through this industry. Curious, in hindsight, did you think that, I don't know if you think, you think in hindsight, do you think somebody was stealing some of the deals? I mean, oh for 50 seems like kind of like horrible lots. I know. I don't think so. It, it's a possibility, Dave. You're right. He might have been, but I don't. I don't think so. I mean, I'll give him credit and say I don't think so. But because some things we were getting term sheets on, but the, the, the pricing was just horrible. You know that people was like, nah, or you know, it just didn't work out. So I still haven't worked with this guy. You know, since since that try. You know, because I just and the thing is, everybody isn't a good fit. You know what I mean? Like you have to decide as a lender what your focus will be, you know, you can't cover all bases. That's what I had to learn the hard way. When I first started lending, I tried to be everything to for everybody in nationwide. And I stretched myself thin, you know, not understanding the value of being a local expert and starting in your back mark. I mean, and starting in your backyard first and then expanding from there. So, you know, I definitely learned a valuable lesson with that alone. Okay. Yeah. Make, makes a lot of sense. And um, so, I, <clears throat> excuse me. And so you started to get, Get, how'd you really start to like get traction and kind of like build your your your, your clientele base? So I built mine through st strategic partnerships. That's how flip funding was able to scale. So, you know, I've realized, I began to realize the value in relationships. You know, it, real estate, you know, real, real relationships are, are everything. And the same applies for financing. You know, even though 
we 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 both do loans. You know, I still consider you know the real estate industry. You know, it's, it's, it's so it's a real relationship based business. So I began to form relationship with anyone who could potentially um, send deals my way, and I targeted people who had the same target demographic as me. So um, title companies, you know, real estate agents, specifically investor friendly real estate agents, wholesalers, because they all work with my clientele on a daily basis so i understand that if i could potentially add value to their business then you know and show that value then they'll be you know more inclined to send me some to send me deals and that's what i did you know um form a relationship with you know those types of um those types of people and that's how i scaled my business yeah okay oh, excuse me thank you and so how'd you go about like opening up your own company like how, how do you get to to that point it's easy it's easy that's the thing you know so <laughs> i just it's, it's easy for that so that's the thing man like a lot of people don't know and i think it's intentional do you know what i mean like the the powers that be within the hard money industry they want to keep it a secret if i'm not even sure if you're aware but there's no school there's no training there's no testing you know for the hard money industry like there is for traditional lending you know so in order for you to learn this industry, you got to go through the ringer like I did, or okay. you have to know somebody personally and like have them, you know, show you, show you the game, you know, and you got to shadow them for a while. It, it's tough. So um, I just formed something called the Hard Money University because I want to change that. You know, it's definitely not an, um, a lot of minorities in the business and it's not a lot of like young people really in it, in it period, you know, because um, people don't, it's like a myth. People don't know how to get into it. Mm -hmm. So I created a platform called Hard Money University to teach people how to actually get into the industry. But to answer your question, um, it's as simple as forming an LLC. And the biggest thing is just finding capital sources. You know, if you find, if you have the capital source and then you can generate leads, then you're basically in the game. It's as easy as that, you know, to start as a hard money broker. Okay, yeah, so that, that was going to be my, my question. And so um, how, how does one go about the capital source because to me that, that's what i assume was the hardest part about being lenders getting the money to to lend out like how do you uh how, how did you go about getting a capital source how, what would you recommend as far as um the average joe getting that maybe not the average joe but somebody getting the capital source so i mean all right so my my journey was i started out as a broker so as a broker you don't need any capital because you're essentially using everybody else's capital so you just have to end up as a broker you can broker private money but most people like me, if you don't come from an affluent background and you're not affluent or don't have the contacts to raise money from, then you're left to deal with institutions. Um, and it's really just big lenders. It's really big lenders that are looking for people that could generate, you know, business for them. So that's really how it works. You know, um, you know I'm sure people know big lenders out here, even, you know, my company is simple as starting with flip funding. You can apply to become a broker with flip funding. Um, we only work with experienced brokers though because if you're not experienced you can do it if you're not experienced but you're more inclined to need more hand holding and you know and take up a lot of our time so we require people to be experienced you know um but you, it's some people out there you really don't have to be experienced but you got to be careful you got to be cautious because as a hard money broker you don't stand you don't risk any capital because you're not putting up your own capital but you do, you, your, your, your reputation is at risk. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I honestly, I burnt a few relationships when I started out, just because, just, of, you know, pure ignorance, not just not knowing the proper way to move about, you know, being a hard money broker at the time. So, yeah, that's okay. the biggest thing. And so when we say you're partnering with these larger institutions, are you, and not specifically these banks, but like, would it be like a, like a Bank of America or Chase? You're talking about just bigger hard money lenders when you're like, you're getting... Yeah, that. bigger hard money lenders. You, you never want to chase a chase or a Bank of America. No, I mean because they first of all they don't they don't they won't even consider like a, a vacant property. They'll never fund a vacant property. So I'm talking about like, like bigger direct hard money lenders. Yeah. Okay. okay. Are, are there are there um I don't know if you want to want to co-sign anybody, but is anybody you would um want to co-sign like hey maybe you should start there for like if somebody's out there. And if you don't want to co-sign anybody either, that's that's fine. I don't want to co-sign anybody because if they have a bad experience, I don't want to be to blame for it. You know, um, I mean, say flip funding. I mean, flip funding is a you know we're not a large large institution, but we are a direct lender that you can begin broker loans to. You know, I stand on us because yeah. like the difference between us and other people is that 
I'm an actual real estate investor myself. So my perspective on deals, I, I underwrite and analyze deals a lot differently than a lot of other lenders because they just look at it from a pure like numbers perspective. They don't understand like real estate. You know, um, they don't understand that just because someone has a bad credit score doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad deal, you know, or, you know, so I, I assess, you know, risk differently. Okay. And so, um, yeah, because when you guys do, you're essentially evaluating the property, sort of, sort of the person, but more of the property. Is that, that's correct? Yeah. Yeah. So we want to make sure that, you know, you do have the ability, you're willing, you have the willingness and you have the ability to pay, you know, the loan and stuff like that and execute the property, the uh, project successfully. That's the main thing that we care about, you know, um, because it's not, what's well, not, you know, the good thing about hard money is that we realize that it's an investment. So you don't necessarily have to have the capital yourself. You know, I could, I could be dead broke, but if I have a great deal, I know that I have a connection to Dave, you know, so if I present this to Dave, he might be interested in it and we could partner and split this pr uh, property, split the profit or, you know, however we structure the deal to make it a win-win. All right. Thank you. Um, and so are you, are you in all, I guess since you don't need a license, you're able to lend it like in all 50 states, like if somebody. In, no, in, no, 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 no. Okay. States. I guess not. Okay. Yeah. So it's a few states where it's though you cannot lend, you know, um, without a license to do hard money. That's California, uh, Nevada, Arizona, Oregon, Utah, um, Vermont, um, and that's pretty much it. Okay, and, and I guess I guess let me rephrase it, because I kind of, as I said it, I kind of thought in my head, you probably wouldn't lend to certain states where you don't even, we don't know the market in the first place. Is that kind of like your, your model? Or would you lend in a state you're unfamiliar with? Oh yeah, I do it all the time. I do okay, it all the okay. Time. Yeah. So, so, so how do you go, how do you go about appraising those those deals then? Um. So in those situations like that, I've been doing it for so long. We've done deals everywhere, and we we coordinate. Well, we we keep a, a Excel spreadsheet full of all the like appraisers that we've ever worked with. So we pretty much have a relationship in any market. Um. And so we reach out and to a, a appraiser that we have a familiar, you know, familiar. Uh, I mean, I've, I've had, we've had rapport with. And we have them to do the project, uh, do the appraisal on that project. Okay. And so, um, uh, okay. And so, like, me personally, like, if I, if I was like, hey, I wonder, I saw, I saw I got some experience and I, I'm like, hey, I, I joined the company. Am I, and I want to be a broker, like, I'm in the, the DFW era. Do I have the DFW market or like, are there different markets for your different brokers or just every man for them, themselves or wherever they? Every man for themselves because, I mean, believe it or not. And I had to learn this, you know, myself, you know, from experience. It could be a hundred different hard money lenders in the DFW area. You know, it's still enough money out there for everybody. You know what I mean? Because one thing I had to realize, everybody is not going to work with you. You know, some people are going to like you, some people aren't. You know, some people are going to have an existing relationship with other people that they're going to be more inclined to work with. But there's still, you know, opportunity, enough opportunity out there for everybody. So I would highly recommend it. Again, you start in your backyard. But you being from the DMV, you know, you have relationships here. So, you know, you don't just want to let those relationships just sit, you know. You know, you, you want to take advantage of all of that stuff. But, you know, so take advantage of all your existing relationships, but start in your backyard, you know, because you'll be more inclined to win business that way. But to answer your question, you can do it from anywhere. You know, you can lend deal. I mean, you can fund deals in California anywhere without ever looking at the property without having a full understanding of what's going on in that market um, because it's all you know it's all about the numbers as long as there's a profit there there's enough sufficient equity in the event that worst case scenario you default and we have to take the property back you know again i'm an investor so i understand how to wholesale a property and still make a probably an even higher profit on the on the deal you know so you know we really are in a, a great position a secure position Okay, and let's assume I want to go the route and just open my own company. Like you're, I could go get funding. Like I could go get funding from you, right? That's what you're saying. I can get funding from, yeah. from you guys. Okay, um, mm -hmm. and then so you mentioned uh, earlier the Hard Money University. Um, yeah. How do is that like is that your bio? How do folks get involved in 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 uh, kind of in that? So um, you can uh, visit my Instagram Rod underscore R O D underscore Hard Money, and you'll see my link tree. And I have uh, some options there. So you can uh, sign up to watch the webinar. And um, I present the entire opportunity, you know, um, show, all, show everything, you know, pretty much. I show people how to earn as little as 
five figures or up to six and seven figures a year. And I use five, six and seven figures because everybody's had, everybody has different goals. You know, some people may be a real estate agent and they just look at, you know, getting an additional stream of income. That's something that they can do without doing much, much extra work, especially if they're investor focused, you know, wholesalers, they can do this on the side and make an additional money. They can get paid twice on a deal instead of, you know, just off of the uh, assignment fee. So, um, they might just, you know, just want to do it in addition. So their goal might be an extra five uh, figures a year. Uh, but then someone that wants to jump into business and make six and seven figures, I showed them how to do that as well on this and webinar. This, and this is where the complete, the complete novice can go this route, correct? Uh, yeah, oh yeah, Com a complete novice can go this route, absolutely. You know, okay. so I did it as a complete novice, but yeah. my, my, my journey was a lot rougher than, you know, anybody else would be, for sure. Okay. And so uh, I, was, I know you can't promise anybody anything, but, um, so I start the course. I'm a complete novice. I finish it. Like, would I be able to to work directly with you? I know you mentioned you only work with experienced folks. Is yeah. that it? Okay. So, yeah. So, I mean, as a bonus for joining my, my course, what I do, actually, this is the second week. I'm doing like a case study group first, you know, just um, so I'm just started that. This is the we're on the third week this Thursday. So second weekend, I already have one of my students. He has a property. Uh, the, bar, the borrower just gave him the green light. So we're working to get that one funded right now. But my entire goal is to be, have everyone in a position to close their first deal within 30 days. Not saying that you will close a deal in yeah. the first 30 days, but yeah. be in a position to close deals for sure. Like a company up and running, you have a knowledge and confidence to you know begin marketing and getting deals on the way. And if you're not confident yet, still you know market and I'll walk you through once you get a, you know, a, a serious lead. Okay, thank you. What, what does someone, um, I know uh, maybe stuff may vary, but what does someone typically make like on a, on a lot, I don't know, $200,000 loan or what, is, what does somebody typically make on, on that? So on a, let's say a $200,000 loan, that's great because that's conservative. So we set an expectation low, y'all, because right. we know like the average property, you know, um, value right now in the U.S. is like in 300 and something, 300 and something K. But, you know, that's based off of that 200, purchase, what, $200,000 loan amount. Um, you can make up to 2%. At, well, you can make more. You get what you negotiate, but, you know, it's a competitive market. You can't be greedy out here. So you can make anywhere from one to two bips, you know, one to two points for those who are not familiar with bips and points equal uh, equi uh, a percentage. So if I say one, one, point, one point, that's 1%. If at two points, that's 2% of the loan. Amount. So if, you know, somebody charged two points on a $200,000 loan, that's a potential $4,000 profit on that property. If they charge one point, then that's two thousand dollar profit. Now, the good thing though about being a hard money lender, let's say it's a fix and flip or a new construction loan, you know the burst strategy is extremely popular right now. I would say that's probably the most popular. So you kind of get a two for one deal. You know, if you get somebody in on a fix and flip, if you get, you know if you're doing long term loans as well, and you you if you give them a good experience on that short term loan, they're gonna come right back and get yeah. a refi. You know, so you know you can get two deals on one trend. Well two transactions from one bar. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, you get them on the short then. Yeah, because yeah, cause what, what he's kind of saying is basically, typically for hard money, it's, it's a shorter term loan because, you know, it's a higher percentage rate, then you refinance it into to the to the long term. So, yeah, that, that, uh, yeah, you got a double double dip there. Yeah. Um, and this, and I meant to ask you this at the very beginning too, but can you go over that, that, that analogy I, I kind of mentioned in the beginning where you talked about the comparing like the, credit card APR to like the, the APR with the hard money lending, you know, where folks are like complaining about a credit card, but, uh, absolutely or hard money and you still doing the credit card thing. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, there's always an exception to that because, yeah. you know, we, these days we have people, you know, um, leveraging credit cards to do make this some business moves and, and so forth. But, mm -hmm. you know, for the most part, people get those credit cards, you're going shopping, you know what I mean? You're going, you're getting the latest sneaks and everybody will be flying us and that. That's cool. Right. But, it's about prioritizing, you know what I mean? You can't complain about a 10% interest rate if you're gonna be gladly signing off on a 26% APR credit card that's putting you in debt, you know? Mm -hmm. That same that, that same interest, you know, that well, let's take the 10%, right? Yeah. Um, you get, to, all right, 10%, whoa, sounds high compared to a 3% interest rate, you know, but what you're able to do with those funds is, 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 is utilize leverage, you know? so. For those that don't know, I know Dave understands, but let's let's say, for instance, you have $100,000 saved up, right? 
somebody you go to um, apply for a loan and say you see a property, you go to apply for a loan and they say 10%, I say you 10%, you're like, I'm not paying 10%, like, mm -hmm. I'll pay cash for that property. Mm -hmm. You got the cash, you buy, you buy $100,000, you running out, let's say you're getting $1,000 a month. Cool, you know, you're making $1,000 residual income every single month, all right? But at the end of the day, you're losing. Like, you're losing, and I'm gonna tell you how. Well, you're not losing, but you, you know, you're selling yourself short because you can take that same $100,000, Come back and get a loan at ten percent for me. Well, not for a long term loan, but this is just for example, y'all. You know, let's say you got a loan, um, you acquire it. Instead of putting that whole hundred thousand dollars down, you would only have to put twenty percent down of that hundred thousand. So you're only putting up twenty thousand of your money to you know acquire that property. You got the property. Now we're not talking about the fees and stuff like that associated with it. You got the property. You're gonna put twenty thousand dollars down. You still have eighty thousand dollars left. And let's say let's wipe 20 grand left. Let's 20, like wipe 20 grand out in potential fees for all these transactions that I'm about to mention. So yeah, 80. Let's say 20 grand will go to fees. Now, with that, you got 60 now. Now you're able to get three more properties. Mm -hmm. So you have four properties instead of that one. Now, the difference is you got a mortgage. So let's say your mortgage is 500 or something like that. So now you're clearing $500 from each property. Whereas though with that hundred thousand you put to purchase that property, you were making a thousand a month. Now you have four properties, and you only make a five hundred dollar profit on each. But that equates to two thousand dollars in residual income each month. So you you, you cap you're benefiting off the residual income. But then you talk about appreciation. Now let's say this is a turnkey property, right? Didn't need any rehab funds or anything like that. We know from in two thousand one. The property value skyrocketed. You know, most values went up at least like 30% throughout the US. So you got these properties at 100,000 market value. If you held them, you got them in 2020, you held them, you got them now, they were 130. If you would have had that one property, you would have seen, you know, realized 30,000 equity, which is still cool, you know. But since you leveraged that money and got this loan, this 10% loan, you know, now you're in a position, you, you acquired four properties. So that 30 is multiplied by four. So that gives you $120,000 equity and two thousand and an additional $1,000 a month in income. You know, so you tell me which is the better yeah. option, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so you, you mentioned you mentioned turnkey properties. Do you find folks are buying turnkey properties with hard money just because they have, have bad credit or kind of what, what scenario with somebody buying a turnkey property with, with hard money? So hard money, it's not always as hard as it sounds, you know. So we do long-term loans as well that are pretty, you know, it's not as low as a traditional loan, but it's it's in line with that. So about a month ago, we had loans as low as 3.75 interest, you know, and, you know, the interest traditional may have been down 2.75 or three and a quarter or something like that. So it's not too bad, you know. So hard money isn't as hard as it used to be. And a lot of people aren't aware of that. We do long-term 30-year fixed loans, you know, now, as a result of the Fed hikes, they're up in the 6%, you know, and with <laughs> over a month, believe it or not. But just last month, we was down to low fours, you know, high threes. So so, um, if, so if I have, I have poor credit and I can't qualify traditional financing, I can just go to you guys and I could probably get a, like a 5% five, a five oh, yeah. on a turnkey? Okay. Uh, yeah. And, you know, and, so, an investment property of that? Yeah, an investment property, absolutely. That, so, that's, that's crazy. I would have never, that never, I would never have thought of that. Oh, yeah. So the thing, all right. So another um, thing that separates flip funding from a lot of the other hard money lenders is that we offer long term loans with the credit score as low as 600. You okay. know, um, most hard money lenders, whereas the tradition was like 580, you know, tradition, I mean, the hard money lenders, usually you have to have a 680 credit score to, to qualify for a long term loan. But you know, the benefit is, again, we're creative because Let's say, Dave, your credit is 580, but you're trying to get a, a refi, man. You, you, you just did a flip or a new construction project. You need to get out of this loan. It's maturing. Um, you can utilize, your credit could be 400, but you can add your wife to the operating agreement and now she becomes your partner and you utilize her credit to qualify for the loan. So, you know, we, it is, it's workarounds, you know, always creative solutions for these scenarios. Oh, okay. Wow. That did, did, did not, did, didn't matter. Um, what, what, is, what are a few um, myths you want to maybe dispel about hard money that you, you may hear, you may see, may see online? Well, for one, that the terms are, you know, like predatory. So I just showed you an example how 
Hard money lenders also offer, you know, what can be considered soft money. So we have low interest rates for long-term loans. And people have to understand that short-term loans, you know, they have higher interest rates because they're short-term loans. You got to make your money somewhere, you know what I mean? So that's why, you know, if you're on a 12-month loan, interest rate is going to be, you know, anywhere from, like, our highest interest rate, even for a first-time investor, is 10.5%. You know, and I, I think that's pretty competitive for someone who hasn't proven themselves. Yeah. You know, um, but someone with you know decent experience can qualify anywhere as low as seven and a half percent for like a fix and flip or a new construction loan. Okay. Um, yeah, but so what but a lot of people don't realize is that hard money is becoming an institutional game. You know, it's like you have Wall Street capitalizing on this on this niche now, you know, so they're all trying to get into it and it's competitive, so it's driving the rates down. It's not in the past, it was brutal. You know, you prior to me getting in the industry. I mean, they were seeing interest rates anywhere from 14 to 20 percent. And, you know, people were taking it, you know, with a smile <laughs> because that's just what it was. But now, you know, people look at you like you're a madman if you try that stuff. So it's not as hard as it sounds. You know, it's not a difficult process because we don't ask. It takes it's much shorter, you know, not much shorter because even traditional loans, they, they're getting faster, you know. But um, you can close a typical hard money loan within two Two weeks if it's a fix and flip loan, three weeks if it's a long term loan, you know, really, because it's underwritten more, underwritten more like a traditional loan. Um, but yeah, I mean, so we never require any tax returns, even for long term loans. So we're not as document heavy. Um, and again, we're not as focused on the individual because it's not about you, it's about the actual investment property. And, you know, that's what, that's what we, we're focused on. So uh, I would say before you run with any myths or, you know, um, perceptions in your head, talk to somebody. You can, you know, email me, give me a call, shoot me a DM, or talk to any other hard money lenders and interview them, you know, um, ask, ask, ask questions, you know, um, yeah, for sure. Oh, okay, cool. Um, cool. Well, pr appreciate your, 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 your time. Like I said, I learned, I, I learned a lot. Like I said, this is a topic that I've, I've been around, but never really, really dove into uh, directly. So I really appreciate your time. Thanks for hopping on the, uh, the program with me. Um, no my, my last question, um, I always ask this guest the same question. Um, let's say I gave you a, a million dollars and you have mm -hmm. a week to spend it on real estate or real estate adjacent, a real estate adjacent item, um, or you lose the money, you have to spend all a million dollars. What would you use it on? I would, I would fund deals with it. <laughs> I would fund deals with it. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. So as a broker, you know, you get paid off the origination. You know I mean? That, that's cool. But people don't know you can get residual income as a lender as well. So, for instance, let's take this million dollars, right? So, my model, we didn't dive into my business model as a direct lender, but I'm going to explain it here. So, okay. it's, it's, tradi it's traditionally like three things. You know, when you're a direct lender, usually either you have a fund, you know, and you're raising money from private investors and stuff like that. Um, or you have a capital, you know, you're affluent, you have a ton of capital, which is not most people. Um or like my model with flip funding, you know, I use some of my money, you know, but I also have some private lenders. And what we do is after we fund the deal with our capital, but then I sell it off to third party investors. You know, I sell it to those institutions that I just mentioned and they're called aggregators. So they package it up, they package these loans up and sell them to Wall Street, sell them on Wall Street as securities and stuff. So, um, so what I would do with that million dollars, let's say, it was a million dollar loan, you know, a million dollar loan. I would take that million dollars and fund the deal. That's, I might charge two points on that. So 2%, you know, on a million dollar deal, 20,000. So I make 20,000 right off the top on that, on that uh, particular scenario. Um, I don't have to deal with any contractors, any tenants or anything like that, you know? So that's why I would choose lending, but then that's the origination. But I'm selling to my note buyer. My note buyer might give me a coupon. A coupon is like what they're going to buy my loan for that I'm selling them. Six, let's say 6%, right? For that loan that we just funded, I might charge the borrower 9%. And there's a spread of 3% there. You know, 3% on, you know, 3 million is 30,000. So it's a potential 30, if it's a 12 month loan, let's say, you know, so I, now I get that, that money every single month. It's called the interest remittance. But it's not thirty thousand a month. Obviously, it's thirty thousand divided by twelve, and that's what I would get every single month for you know funding that deal until it's paid off. So okay. you know, yeah, a lot of people don't realize that you get mailbox money as a lender as well. 
Okay, yeah, yeah. I, was, I guess I was, I was one of those people. Um, yeah, and then, you know, so I'll get to sell that loan though. Sell that loan, I recycle the capital, and I can do it again that next week. So that's a potential fifty thousand dollars profit on that one deal in one week. Not, 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 not bad, not bad business. So. Yeah. And so you mentioned a little bit again, but where, where can the folks uh, find you at? Yep. So you can find me on Instagram. My uh, handle is Rod R O D underscore Hard Money. Um, follow me. You know, uh, definitely tune in. Uh, you can also email me rod at flipfunding.com. Uh, you can check out our website, flipfunding.com. Um, the Hard Money University website will be up soon. That'll be hardmoneyuniversity.com. Um, but for now, you can uh, tune in to my link tree um, by following me on Instagram, tap the link tree, and you'll be able to sign up for, to watch the webinar to learn how to break into the hard money industry and become the, the finance plug. Okay, awesome. And um, you probably seen this because you're listening to watch the episode, but all that information will be in the in the bio to this this episode. So um, yeah, once again, appreciate it. Uh, thanks for your time. There is a no outro to the show, so it is over. <laughs>